Are you a man really about to tell us what a woman is? You see the same in the pro-life debate. It's like, well, if you don't have a womb, then you're not allowed to talk about it because you can't know the truth. This is false thinking. God's preferred pronouns are he, him. And he has quite a bit to say about what a woman is. But it's good because what he says is true. And truth is true no matter who says it. Well, good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, today, I intend to be saying a few uh, challenging and maybe even slightly controversial things, but I am shamelessly relying on the fact that I'm saying it with an accent to, <laughs> to win me a little extra favor, right? So we'll see how we go. Um, the title of my talk is Male and Female, He Created Them. And uh, it's based on a text in Genesis chapter 1, which we all know, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And it's that last line in particular I want to focus on. But first, I'd, I'd like to open uh, with prayer before we get into the weeds that God would help us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks that you've brought us together this morning to consider the truth of your word, especially this great truth which is under such powerful attack in our day on what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Lord, we thank you that in creation, in your infinite wisdom, you made every human being in your image and also you made men and women and called us to be men and to be women. Lord, help us to focus on the goodness of this call. Father, help us to submit ourselves to your will in this regard, uh, that we might be a witness to a lost and a confused world. Uh, Father, we do ask for your help to be at work in our hearts, uh, both me as the speaker and all who are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, male and female, he created them. Now, the flow of that little verse is that God made us all the same in His image, and then He made humans with differences as well as male and female. And the question that comes from that is, well, what does the difference mean? What is maleness and what is femaleness? And we all know, I think, by now that uh, there has been a great controversy in the culture about what is a woman. Um, and apparently, the mic drop answer is an adult human female. Um, I'd like to suggest that's a fun answer, but it's not the mic drop answer, it's a true answer. Um, it's the obvious answer. It's an answer that doesn't go particularly deep, uh, it's an answer that tells us all in this room what we already know. Uh, it's an answer that doesn't challenge us insofar it doesn't tell it, as it doesn't tell us how being a man or a woman ought to shape our behavior and how to live and what we value. Because there is something more to a woman than her biology, and there is something more to a man than his biology. There's something deeper. There's something which goes to the kind of person we are called to be something that goes to questions of virtue and questions of character, and that's what I want to talk about today. But I want to address two concerns that our modern culture might throw up at this point before I get started. And the first concern is this. It goes something like, well, are you a man really about to tell us, women, what a woman is? Well, that's a good point in some ways, isn't it? Um, but it does come from a culture that says increasingly, you can't know the truth which applies to a certain group unless you are from that group. A culture that we see this, for example, in the racial divides, uh, how that there is those with lighter skin and darker skin, and uh, what we do is we oppress each other and we are victims of each other, and we can't access each other's lived experience, so we can't really presume to know uh, the truth for each other. We can only know our own truth. You see the same in the pro-life debate. It's like, well, if you don't have a womb, then you're not allowed to talk about it. 
because you can't know the truth. Um, this is false thinking. Uh, you know, God's preferred pronouns are he, him, and he has quite a bit to say about what a woman is. But it's good because what he says is true. And truth is true no matter who says it. And so my job this morning when I talk about man and woman is just to tell the truth. Uh, and the truth might upset some people, some people might love it. The question is, is it true? Not who said it. Uh, and it's very sad, our culture is uh, turning into uh, a warring, warring tribes of identity groups. Uh, and that's one of the things actually that's pushing men and women apart in our culture. And as we shall see, men and women were actually made for each other. Uh, so this is contrary to God's will and God's design. Okay, that's the first objection. The second objection which the modern culture often throws up, and this could be quite personal for some in the room, so I don't want to make light of it, but it's the, but what about me objection. Whenever you come to questions of uh, principle and Genesis blueprints, like, you know, you might say, well, marriage is good, God means us to get married. You might say, well, here's God's hallmarks of femininity and here's how to exercise those and all this. And someone will say, but what about me? My life hasn't worked out that way. Um, it's a very good point. And we must understand that we don't live in a world in which everything is absolutely perfectly conformed to what it was in Genesis 1 to 3. There are people in circumstances that don't fit the blueprint as neatly as they might like. And I want to say a couple of things about that. Number one, uh, if any of us is an exception, that's not the end of the road. That's okay, actually, um, because God uses those who are exceptions often to do exceptional things, and by that, you know, you think of the Apostle Paul, an exception, hmm? right? And he didn't use his exceptionalism to say, we shouldn't be saying marriage is good. On the contrary, most of the teaching on marriage in the New Testament is from the Apostle Paul, but he wasn't married. And God, He was an exception, and God used Him for something exceptional. I just mean something really different and unique. And think of Jesus in Matthew 19, where He talks about the fact that some are made eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, there are things that God can call people to do, regardless of their circumstances. And so, it's never a dead-end road. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is... Um, Don't use your circumstances to attack those who state things that are generally true. It is generally true, for example, that God means people to marry. And don't use your circumstances, your but what about me instinct, to tear that down. On the contrary, you too should promote that truth. And we need to be comfortable sometimes if we are in that category of an exception. And that's fine because an exception is actually something that the Bible accounts for and something that the Bible speaks to. And I'm not going to be ignorant of exceptions this morning, don't worry about that. Uh, we will talk in a way that applies to all of us. Uh, it's something, um, I think it's, um, I first heard it from Vody Borkham. Uh, he uses this phrase, standpoint epistemology. You try to make truth conform to your own standpoint, your own experience. Careful about that. Uh, always be happy for the truth to be told. Um, anyway, those are two objections that I just want to deal with up front into the subject matter, man and woman. The first thing that many people in today's world will tell us when we talk about man and woman is that men and women are equal. I want to ask a question, what does equal mean? Equal actually means the same. An equal sign in a mathematical equation means the same. What's on the left is ultimately the same as what's on the right. One equals one, true. One equals five, not true. But then you say, but Martin, are you telling me that one number is inherently worse than the other? Surely all numbers are inherently equal. Uh, that's not what I was saying. I was saying that they're not the same. I could say... Uh, a Ford F-150 and a pair of roller skates are equal. <laughs> and you say, well, they're not the same. But what if I said, 
A Ford F-150 and a pair of roller skates are equal in this respect. They are both modes of transportation that use wheels. You say, well, that's true. So the real question is equal with respect to what? That's the real question. And men and women are equal. They are the same with respect to some things, and they are very profound things indeed. But we must never forget that we are different with respect to some things as well. And the reason I say that is because in the culture, this whole men and women are equal thing, without qualification, I think has been one of the things that has been driving this view that men and women are, are, sub, are just the same. They can be substituted for each other, no problem. Uh, you can have two men with a child, right? Because men and women are equal. What difference does it make? You can have men competing in women's sports because they're the same. What difference does it make? Uh, or, you know, we are starting to now look out at, say, the corporate world and the political world and say, well, men and women should dominate these spheres just the same because there's no difference. I say, well, if women are having children, then you might not expect that to see that so neatly. Um, if men and women are equal, then it is wrong to talk about our differences. So men and women are equal with respect to some things, but not others. And that's a truth that we have to uphold. I mean, the obvious one is childbirth. Only women can have children. A uh, radical thing to say in today's world. Um, but men and women are not equal in their relationship to that truth. Uh, there's differences. So we are equal with respect to some things, different with respect to others. You say, well, what are we equal with respect to? I'm going to mention two things. The first one is, and it's in the text, we are both made to image God. We are both made human beings to image God. And that's actually the most fundamental calling on the human race. And you say, what does it mean to image God? Uh, and I can explain this with a short story. Uh, when I was doing ministry in Australia, there was a lady who was a very talented artist, and she sent me a painting of me, a portrait. She had found a photograph and she'd painted my portrait and she mailed it to my office. And it was very skillfully done. But of course, I had a problem because I opened it and I thought, well, what am I going to do with this? Uh, I mean, I'm not Anthony Fauci, it's not going on my wall. Um, he, <laughs> he has a couple of his own portraits of himself in his office. Uh, but if I ever do that, you can call me out, there's something wrong. Uh, and I thought, what will I do? So I had a bright idea, I thought, I'll send it to my mum. And I packaged it back up, sent it to my mum, and fortunately, my mum decided to keep it, uh, and she's hung it over her piano. And I was up at my parents' place once talking to my 10 nieces and nephews, and I said to them, uh, see that uh, painting over there? And they all screamed out together, that's you! Uh, and I might have surprised them because I said, you know, it's actually not me. It's my image. It's something that puts me on display, even though it isn't actually me. It captures my likeness. And see, that's what human beings were made to be. They're not, we're not God. And we need to remind ourselves of that these days. We're not gods, but we were made in some sense to put God on display, to image Him so that angels looking at creation could see human beings and go, oh, this reminds me of the Creator Himself. And you say, well, how would we do that in essence? And the answer comes in two scriptures, which you can look at in your own time. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 to 24. And there are two features that I want to single out from those scriptures that are, that are attributed to what it means to be in God's image and likeness, and they are holiness and righteousness. Human beings were made to be holy as God is holy. And human beings were made to uh, do acts of righteousness as God's acts are righteous. Now, that's the summary. Holiness is like a focus on sinlessness, purity, being sanctified. Righteousness is a focus on action, deeds, doing God's will in God's world. So we were made for sanctification, for holiness, to reflect God's moral glory. And that's what we will be one day in heaven. What does John say? It says, uh, we do not now know what we shall be, uh, except when we see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies Himself, 
as He is pure. That's the great end of the Christian life, to see God because our sin will be completely removed. And you say, well, men and women, is there any difference in this? No. Men and women are both called to image God uh, from the very beginning. And that's what Galatians 4 means when it says, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. In other words, in the matter of salvation, in the matter of being called back to God's image in Christ, in the matter of that ultimate plan God has for the human race, remember we were made in God's image, we fell in Adam's image and we're being restored into the image of Christ. That's the, that's the story of history for each of us who know God. All of that, in that there is no difference of sex, race or class, it's the greatest equality in the world. God's plan that we would bear His image goes through Christ to everyone. And that's important. Actually, there's a practical implication of that. I, um, there are actually some people who believe that all the spiritual stuff is for the men. There are actually some people who believe that heavy theology and Bible study is a, is a male thing. I mean, all that's just rubbish, um, just rubbish. Uh, and I'm not surprised you agree because you're at a women's conference, so. <laughs> uh, but this is, you know, our salvation and our being saved, being sanctified, is something that is equally for all of us. Um, another way in which men and women are the same is that we're made for each other. Uh, literally, a match made in heaven, Adam and Eve. And we read in Genesis 2 that a man and a woman are capable of becoming one flesh. That is, a perfect harmony of two that become one. Uh, now, Again, this is something which goes up against the grain of culture in many ways. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I was uh, in a grocery store and I heard a song, which I then went and looked up, and apparently it's by Alicia Dixon, and it's called The Boy Does Nothing. It says, does he wash up? Never wash up. Does he clean up? No, he never cleans up. Does he brush up? Never brushed up. He does nothing. The boy does nothing. Uh, <laughs> sadly, a little truth in it. Uh, <laughs> sadly, uh, but she's calling her significant other the boy, and the song is about the fact that he's quite useless. Uh, you know, the movie Barbie was released not long ago, uh, and you know, Ken is a boy that does nothing. He's an accessory, like a handbag. And on the male side of things, you've got this movement, which is quite big, actually, online, called Men Going Their Own Way, M-G-T-O-W. And these guys, they say, well, marriage is for fools, feminism makes us the losers, feminists will take us to the cleaners, and uh, falling in love with a woman is how you get robbed blind by the system. Solution, use and abuse women, don't commit. You can see there's a lot of forces at play in our culture that drive us apart and say, I even mentioned one before, this whole splitting of us into identity groups. Uh, and it says, no, we're actually fundamentally opposed to each other. We're not fundamentally for uniting with each other. Uh, that's what the world is saying. Uh, but God made and men and women for each other. And so we are res equal with respect to our call to image God, which is the way, what we were made for, and salvation itself, which calls us back to that, uh, 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 that original commission. And we are also equal in our design, the fact that we are designed for each other in marriage. You say, yeah, yeah, okay, that's the boring stuff. What about our differences? And what about the interesting bits? Okay. Let me say something about our differences, and I'll spend the rest of my time on this. You know, when it comes to this question, much is made in our world about mere differences of personality and preference. You know, a girl might be a tomboy because she rides a motorbike and fixes fences. She's considered more masculine. 
Uh, and we make a big deal about that and say that's the issue. A boy might be considered more feminine or girly because he likes the ballet and wants to be a costume designer. And you know, the transgender movement has come along and placed huge significance on these differences of personality and preference and claims that they are indicative of a gender identity that does not align with biological sex. And many children in the Western world right now have been deceived on that basis to pursue life-altering and frankly life-destroying treatments because they believe that they are a man in a woman's body or a woman in a man's body. It's a deception. I want to say very clearly from the outset that that line of thinking is nonsense. These things, these mere preference issues, are not ultimately significant to our essential maleness and femaleness. You say, well, what is significant? Well, Genesis tells us that, we're called, that it is what we're called to do that is significant. There's things women are called to do, and there's things men are called to do in their creation mandates, and it's in Genesis chapter 2. The man is made, the man is given a job, and then the need for the woman is articulated and the reason for the need is stated, and then the woman is made and the woman is given a job. And then they are united and given a job together. And you see sameness and difference all through Genesis chapter 2, and it has a lot to do with what we are called to do. But when we find out what we're supposed to be doing, we also find out what we're supposed to be like. Uh, a woman has a creation mandate to pursue, and it is right, and this is the testimony of the rest of the Bible, if you look at any scripture that, directs, that is directly addressing women, it will list virtues. And these virtues are the things that she should build into her character to be the kind of person that can pursue that creation mandate. It's virtuous, it's feminine. A, a man has a creation mandate to pursue and he needs to build in himself the kind of character that is necessary to pursue it well. And again, the passages of Scripture that are addressed directly to men and list certain virtues, you can always, if you, once I finish this creation piece, you'll see the connections. You go, oh, it's consistent, the Bible speaks with one voice, who knew? Uh, <laughs> Old Testament and New Testament, right? Um, you know, it's also virtuous to promote feminine and masculine callings in general, regardless of your life circumstances, but to promote them and honour them in general. That's a good thing to do. Our world tears them all down. Uh, now, it brings me to the terms masculinity and femininity. What are they? Well, let me put it like this. Masculinity is something like this. It's the innate quality that God has placed within men, that He made male as part of His creation design, which enables them to pursue their masculine mandate better than women ever could with more impact than women ever could. That's the difference. See, what we're called to do is consistent with what God has placed within us, what we are like. Femininity is the same. The innate quality which God has placed within a woman in His creation of female, which enables her to pursue the feminine mandate with an effectiveness and a power that no man could ever replicate. There are things women can do that men cannot replicate and reproduce in the same way, with the same effect and the same power. A man can never be a mother. He can't do it. He can imitate, he can mimic, uh, but there will always be something that an actual mother brings to the table which is qualitatively different. Uh, and it goes the same way with some of the male things which we'll get into soon. Um, you know, well, actually, I'll say it now. You know, if men tried to be all the mothers in this generation, it wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work. Something profound would be lost from God's order and God's purposes would be corrupted. We need femininity for that, not masculinity. Uh, if women tried to be the sole and main spiritual leadership of this generation, that wouldn't work either because Isaiah 3 says that that is God's judgment on a society when the men are missing in action on that front. 
and something would be lost from God's order and God's purposes would be corrupted in such circumstances. We need masculinity for that in order to see it done to God's design. So, what are the callings in Genesis 2 that we are given as man and woman in our creation design? I can sum, sum them up in four words. For men, the man is made, he's put in the garden, he's got two jobs to do. One, to work. And the Hebrew word is abad, A-B-A-D. The second thing is to keep. Well, there's various translations of the word, but the Hebrew word is shamar, S-H-A-M-A-R. Okay, he gets to work and to keep. And then God says, something's missing. We need a woman. And so the woman is made. And the reason, the role, the place she's given is described in two words. The first word is helper. It's translated differently in different translations, but let's go with that one, helper. Hebrew is azer, A-Y-Z-E-R. And the other Genesis word that is given to women is mother. Now, I want to say from the beginning, and I'll come back to this, these are not the last words on women or men. They are the first words. So, in other words, they're not saying that these are limits, they're saying these are commissions, these are the starting points, these are the centers of gravity that are in a man and a woman. Um, In addition to that, They are very good words. Remember, God saw it and called it very good. And all of God's work is perfect, and this is before the fall. And so they demand our serious attention. They demand our study. We know that they are good. We know that they are the beginning. We know that they are centers of gravity which explain why God made us different as male and female. Okay, let's drill down into the words, and I'll go for the men first, even though they're not here. Uh, But many of you are raising men. It's important. Many of you are married to men. Many of you are looking to marry men, and you need to know what to look for. I had a friend, actually, long-term friend, and uh, he told me that he was dating a girl And I said, oh, yeah, why? Why do you like her? And he started giving me answers, and they were really lame. Uh, There's just no substance to them. He'd say things like, well, she doesn't take herself too seriously, and uh, all this kind of stuff. Well, that's nice. But not one thing he said was a biblical quality. And I thought, this guy doesn't know what to look for. And I sometimes wonder, maybe we don't know what to look for. That's why I'm going to cover the men, for all of those reasons. Uh, Now, a man's mandate to work and to keep is given to him in relation to the garden, which speaks of a focus towards the world of things around him, okay? And by the way, that's something that's psychologically true of men, and I'm going to come back to this, is that they tend to be more interested in things than women. You know, planes, trains, automobiles, go down to your local model train set society um, and count the women in the room. If you have any fingers up at the end of that count, I'll be very surprised. Uh, There is a general difference in the wiring of men and women in this regard. And the first thing to do in relation to that world of things around him, the area God's put him, the little area of responsibility he has, he has to work. And the Hebrew word to work, abad, means to labor in service. A man is called to work in his world, in service. In other words, not for the sake of himself or for the sake of work itself, and some men do that, but in service to something beyond himself. And then the second word is keep. Hebrew word is shamar, and it speaks of guarding, preserving, saving, If I could summarize this, the man is told to take responsibility for the protection and the prosperity 
of that place where God has put him. Okay? Regarding the work issue, never forget that men are called to industry. They are called to work in the world. And what I often ask younger men when I'm speaking to them is, what is your mission? What is your sense of purpose that's beyond yourself? Where are you going? Don't forget in the New Testament, there's that interesting verse where the Apostle Paul says, if a man does not work and provide for his own, then he is worse than an unbeliever. Uh, There's an interesting sort of first responsibility on a man to work, to serve, um, and to serve through work something beyond himself, and that could be uh, much like Adam. What did Adam have? A family and a garden. Most men have a family and a garden. It's interesting. Uh, Some men have more, some men have something different but it's to serve and others, a family, or maybe something larger, maybe the kingdom of God, maybe a nation, maybe they're in politics. Uh, And the struggle of so many young men, interestingly, is restlessness, a struggle to lock on to a long-term commitment, dropping out of degrees, switching majors, wondering if it's all worth it, uh, and not finishing and seeing things through. Uh, I had that problem when I was about 18, but I had a wise father, and he was having none of it. Uh, And I remember his advice, he used to say things to me like, you must succeed at something, you must have achievements, nothing you do will be wasted. And he forced me to stay the course, he didn't force me, he encouraged me to stay the course to be a man on a mission beyond myself and to build in myself the disciplines and the character to be purposeful and confident because of achievement, not full of self-doubt because of failures. Uh, And that's something that can plague men when they haven't achieved something, when they have failed at something, the self-doubt sets in. Um, But note that the work and the achievement and the industry is not an end in itself. The workaholic makes a big mistake, doesn't he? Uh, because it's all about the work itself, and that's not the point. Um, Another sin of young men which comes out in the Bible in a big way, especially in the New Testament, is idleness. Uh, Can you think of the cost of young men wasting endless hours on computer games, spiraling in the YouTube algorithm wherever it takes them for night after night, Um, just chilling, hanging, foolish talk, empty talk, all these kinds of things that young men preoccupy themselves with in the hours and the days and the weeks and the months in which they are supposed to be equipping themselves to take on more industry for a purpose beyond themselves to serve greater, but also to take on more responsibility because the next thing that Adam was made for, commissioned to, is this responsibility this ability to shoulder the burden of being responsible for the place where God has put him. Uh, And you say, how do you know that? Well, firstly, because of that commission to keep, but also think of this. Uh, Who bears the... whose name is attached to the fall throughout all of Scripture? Right. In Adam, all die. Uh, And you say, well, didn't Eve eat first? It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? And when God seeks to address the issue, He says, where are you, Adam? And the you is singular. He's referring to one person, and it's Adam. Adam is accountable for the overall... um, He is made responsible. The overall responsibility of what happened there is laid at Adam's feet. It doesn't mean that the woman had no accountability at all. She did. There was a curse. Uh, You know, we don't deny people's agency in any way. But God wanted to address the overall context of the situation to Adam himself. And Adam tried to make excuses. He wanted to be a victim and say, no, 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 no. It's your fault. It's her fault. Uh, There's something a little pathetic about men that do that. 
uh, that don't take the cost and don't bear the load. That's what we're supposed to be equipping ourselves to do. You know, Adam played the victim. Jonah was another victim in the Bible. I can't believe you've saved all these people. Now I'm angry and I do well to be angry. Uh, well, that's not a very pretty picture, is it? Uh, or Cain, you know, well, God favors Abel. Oh, woe is me. I'm going to go kill him. Um, the victim mentality is old and it's not a good one. God was having none of that. God made Adam to be responsible, so he held him responsible. And you know, for many men, as I said, their sphere of responsibility is just like Adam's, a garden and a family, and for others it's bigger. And these responsibilities are accountabilities to God. It's interesting, even in Ephesians 5, there's a hint made that actually when a man stands before God on Judgment Day, one of the things that will be addressed to him is the condition of his wife. And you say, well, does that mean she's not responsible? Of course she is. But there's something about a man's place, a man's creation mandate that means that his uh, spiritual condition affects others in a profound way. You say, well, um, what is the nature of this responsibility? And the nature of this responsibility ultimately is not to fight off the neighboring tribes that are coming to carry away the women and children. Uh, it's not ultimately to um, um, uh, uh, go out and subdue beasts for food and all that kind of thing. Uh, it's not ultimately a, a, a strong man kind of responsibility, although that could be part of the picture. But ultimately, it is a spiritual responsibility. Adam's actual, the thing he was actually held accountable for ultimately, the reason his name is attached to the fall for all of Scripture, is that he was first called to apply the Word of God, to see that it was applied in his sphere of responsibility. And that's where he failed. And that's the truest responsibility of all. And you know, this is why some men get it wrong. They may be hard workers in material things and they may furnish a family with material blessings, or whatever else they're serving for, but they forget something. There's another side to their responsibility. It's not just about material matters. They have a spiritual responsibility. They're supposed to be furnishing those uh, for whom they are responsible with spiritual blessing. They're supposed to be godly. They're supposed to be those who understand how to ensure that God's will is upheld in their sphere of responsibility and God's Word is applied there. And this is why, and we must be careful about this, there is a, a little bit of a move on at the moment, particularly um, uh, in, I think it's, it's in homeschool communities, where we say, uh, well, boys are not made for study, boys are not made to sit at desks and write, boys need to be out there and they need to be, you know, riding motorbikes and fixing cars and building fences, you know, don't enslave them to the classroom. And I just want to say, why can't we have both? Because what does Paul say to a young man in the New Testament who he's setting up to take serious responsibility. He says, study, study. And I get it, young guys don't take to it as naturally as young women very often. You know, I, I go and speak to youth conferences and all the young ladies have their notepads and pens out, right? And all the young guys are sitting back with their arms folded. Uh, and I call them out. I say, you've got to start. You need to discipline yourself. Idleness is a sin. You need to discipline yourself to pick up the pen and write and listen and learn, because God is going to call you to a spiritual accountability, and He's going to give you something to be responsible for, probably a family, maybe something else. And in that responsibility, you need to know how to rightly interpret and apply the Word of God. That's what God has called you to do. That was Adam's call, and that is why Adam, through all of history, is made accountable for that failure. Uh, this is the commission of men. And I must say, it's very easy and trendy to say uh, there are things women can do that men can't do. You can say, well, uh, women can multitask, men can't. It's true. Uh, you can say, uh, women can be mothers, men can't. Get off our turf. It's true. Uh, there are things women can do that men can't. But I'll tell you this. The biblical record is that men can acquit spiritual responsibility at large in a way that women can't. And it's just a creation design. Ever since the beginning, patriarchs, prophets, kings, apostles, overwhelmingly God said, this is what I'm calling the man to step up to. 
Uh, it's very important that we remember that. Okay, that's the man bit done. Uh, I'll say an extra prayer before I <laughs> answer what is a woman? Actually, this is good stuff, so I'm mindful of the time, so I better get moving. Uh, what is a woman? Well, it's interesting, a woman's mandate to help and to mother is given in relation to other persons. It's a personal and interpersonal mandate, as opposed to being towards the world at large. And let me just say, maybe it's a good po point to say this, a lot of people come back and say, well, are you saying women shouldn't work? Are you saying women shouldn't be responsible? Are you saying men can't help? I'm not saying that, but I am saying that God in His wisdom put these things in bold type when He addressed women and men, because He knew that we had a masculinity and a femininity within our makeup that enabled us to do these things in a way that the other sex is not as equipped to do them, all right? So we just need to, it's a, it's a question of emphasis and calling. Um, it's not an emphasis of, well, you can't do a million things. There is a question of what are we equipped to do best and how are men and women to work in their own callings to work together to see God's creation design promoted in the world at large, right? That's, that's what we're talking about. But let me go back to this mother and helper thing, this interpersonal orientation, and it's significant. Um, regarding a helper, azer, A-Y-Z-E-R, uh, you know, one of the best translations of this word is a really, really old word, and it's not used anymore, so the translations don't use it, and it sounds a bit strange for those of you who haven't heard it, but it is the word sucker, S-U-C-C-O-R. Uh, and it's a very good translation because it means to render strength, enablement, support, and aid. To render strength, enablement, support, and aid. It's interesting, it's a slightly different emphasis to what you might hear from a motivational speech by a secular woman to secular women you would be more likely to hear the sorts of qualities that uh, have a more assertive element in them. Uh, this creation calling doesn't encourage a woman to independence and self-empowerment so much as it encourages something else. It's, it's actually at odds with the way of the world at large around us. It tells us that here is a woman who is modelled at her best when she's making others their best. See, our world tells women to grasp power, not to give power, to be strong, but not to make strong, to exalt self and be self-empowered, but not to give self to others, to be first, but not to be second, to be independent, not to be interpersonal. Um, we live in days when a woman's creation design has been despised long before the men were in the women's sports. This has been a problem for a long time. But the commission to help and to mother is one that we actually know that women are designed for, obviously biologically, but also psychologically and spiritually. I mean, consider, there's a saying, right, a woman's intuition. I've relied on a woman's intuition many times in life. Uh, there's truth in that saying, that's why it is a saying. There's a basis in reality that women have an interpersonal perception that is different. Um, women tend to have interpersonal antennas that are finely tuned and an interest in the interpersonal. This is why novels written by women for women tend to take on a Jane Austen hue, you know, tales with relationships at the centre. You know, Mr. Darcy likes her. She doesn't like him. <laughs> Suddenly, she does like him. But is it too late because somebody else likes him? <laughs> but all's well in the end because they like each other again. <laughs> and they lived happily ever after. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered the storyline, but 
You notice the relationship is the story, right? Um, you know, I read a lot of books for boys by men when I was growing up, and none of them sounded like that. <laughs> none of them. You know, it was always about some great mission. It was always about solving the crime, you know, destroying the enemy barricades, getting the cattle back, you know, it was building a civilization. It was always some big mission out there. And you know what? Usually there was a pretty young lady in the book. But what did she do? Well, she helped him get the job done. He'd say, great, let's go. And they'd always get on the motorbike together and off they'd go. Uh, it's interesting. Why is it like that? Because we're psychologically wired for something. Uh, you know, I have traveled and traveled and traveled and traveled and traveled over the last 10 years. And I've been in so many people's homes and in so many different cities and in a lot of different countries. And I tell you, there's a pattern emerges. Uh, there are, when I'm in a, in a couple's home, for example, all sorts of things happen which just make me smile because I think about these things. You know, I'll be at the table and the man of the house will start talking to me and we'll increasingly get into a bit of a one-on-one -on -one, and we'll get into this section where he's talking about the old Mustang he's restoring in his garage and what the stocks and the shares are doing and the real estate market at the moment in this local area. And all of a sudden, his wife will lean in and say, uh, Martin, how's your family? And you know, she's doing two things. First of all, she doesn't care about the real estate market. <laughs> but secondly, she's bringing the conversation back to a place that's more accessible for the group. Right? That's what women just do. And by the way, if there are any young men in the room, I'd give them this tip. You know, when you're standing in a big circle and there's girls and guys and they're all teenagers, whenever the conversation turns to something masculine, all the women talk to each other. You see it every time. Um, we have instincts that align with our creation blueprints. It's actually, I'll give you another example. When I speak on subjects, and then I get people come and ask me questions after, actually, often, the guys and the girls have a slightly different inflection on their questions. So I talked about Daniel, and I talked about how he drew lines in the sand. He purposed in his heart beforehand and he drew lines in the sand, and he went off uh, to the kings, uh, to, to, to Babylon, and then the, the crisis point came where they said, eat the food, but he already purposed in his heart, and he said, no. And he, I said, you know, you've got to come up with uh, standards for your own life, purpose in your heart now beforehand as a young person to do the right thing when trouble comes. What are your rules? What are you not going to do? And I also said, and this was the first day of the rest of Daniel's life, he honored God, God saw it, and God looked after him. Anyway, the guys come up afterwards and say, what are some standards for my life? Uh, you know, what are some, some, some ideas for this, this, this list I want to make? Uh, and then the girls come and say, what was the moment in your life that was like Daniel? You know, there's a different inflection on the questions. And it's, I know it's all generalization. And sometimes people say generalizations are unhelpful. I say, no, no, generalizations are very helpful. That's precisely what they're good for. <laughs> they're, they're helpful. They show us general trends, and the general trends are there by design. You know, women can see past, you know, they understand people that see past the, the words they speak. They can anticipate needs and meet them, discern deficiencies and intercede for them, see anxieties and comfort them. They can be interpersonal, strength-giving, life-giving, nurture-giving, tour de forces. They are mothers, they help, they can find many ways to give succor, to render strength and aid to a whole world of people. And you notice the upside down value system of the kingdom of God that's at play here. It's not the usual path to worldly notoriety or the limelight. It's not a corporate climbing, power clenching, fist clenching feminist wonder woman who needs nothing and serves nothing greater than herself and needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. You know, this is uh, generally a quiet and a selfless and a too often unrecognized ministry. I will say this too, it does carry risk. Uh, when you commit to people like this, you can get burned, we know that. Now that might require some wisdom, might require care, but it doesn't mean it's wrong, right? And you think of what Jesus did in His meekness to God's will and all that he went through, I mean, there's a sense in which it wasn't all fun and games. 
And we can't all expect fun and games all our life. Um, you know, what this world doesn't offer or ask of us, God repays a thousandfold. And this is a work for God, it is not a work for men. Okay, that's the help bit. What about mother? I want to say something about this. Um, I was blessed with a very godly mother, and so this is something that um, is very personal for me. But let me put it, start it this way. On the mother side, I, I remember once preaching a sermon about the darkest times in redemptive history. Um, and I talked about the days of Hebrew slavery in Egypt. I talked about the uh, 400 years of silence in the intertestamental period. I talked about the days of the judges when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And actually, it was a woman who came to me afterwards and she said, hey, I feel like we're in a dark time. What should we be praying for? How does God end these dark ages? And I thought about it and I said, do you know what the answer is? He ends them through a mother. How did the days of the judges end? Hannah prayed for Samuel and dedicated him to the Lord's service and he ended that dark era. How did the days of Hebrew slavery end? Well, Pharaoh made a decree, didn't he? All the Hebrew boys should die, they should be killed in childbirth. What fool has a child under such circumstances? Well, a discreet and godly woman who has a child, and what does she do? She hides him, puts him in the bulrushes, oh dear, Pharaoh's daughter finds him, uh, then he goes and lives in Pharaoh's palace, and that is precisely what needed to happen in order for him to be qualified to be the one who would end that dark era. It was because of his mother that he came into the world. Or what about the 400 years of silence in the intertestamental period? An angel visits Mary. Um, Elizabeth has a child, John the Baptist. That's how it ends, and the account of Luke's gospel begins there. Why? Because God has endorsed motherhood from the very beginning. You know, the theologians call it the proto-evangelium, the first gospel. And the first gospel is a promise that salvation will come, that all the evil works of Satan will be destroyed through a woman who has a child, and that child will do the work. But it's interesting, he doesn't start just with the child, he starts with the seed of the woman, which shall crush the serpent. Said God put motherhood right at the center of His grand plan for salvation for all of history. And whilst Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise, that first gospel, it's interesting, there are lesser fulfillments of that which are reverberating all through history, where so often it is the seed of the woman that is the hope of the earth, where God uses mothers and their children to do, you know, to be the next thing that stands against evil and stands for righteousness in a new generation. And people say, oh, it's, in, it's dark times, why would you bring children into this world? That's why we want children in this world, because children are the hope of the next generation, because they could be Satan's next mortal foe. It's interesting, ever since that promise of Genesis 3.15, Satan has hated mothers and hated babies. I mean, we, <laughs> that resonates today, doesn't it? Uh, but, you know, uh, why did Pharaoh make the order to kill all the Hebrew boys? Why did, why did Herod uh, induce the massacre of the innocents, as they call it, when he decided to kill all the boys under two? Because Satan hates children and he was paranoid because he knew that one of them was going to destroy him. And he sought to stamp out the godly line that God was preserving, and he sought to stamp out children whenever he sensed that God was at work. And you think of today's world, and you think of the way in which the things I'm saying are so countercultural. You think of the way that women who are mothers are just sort of forgotten, and they're just a mum, right? That's the sort of language we hear all the time. And you know the way in which the secularists are pushing women out away from family into workplace and all this kind of other stuff, and they're saying, no, there's a better way, there's a more empowering way, there's a more fulfilling way, and none of it has to do with what God has called good in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. And you think of all the ideologies that are pitting women against men, 
and the ideologies and the, that, that are putting women into sexual promiscuity and abortion and all this kind of stuff. And you say, what's going on? Well, I'm saying nothing's changed. God hates women and he hates babies. I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nearly, nearly had a lightning bolt from heaven strike me down then. God <laughs> loves women <laughs> and babies and therefore, Satan hates women and hates babies. <laughs> wow, say a prayer for my preservation. Uh, my goodness, lucky I picked that up. Uh, I was thinking, gee, they're all very quiet, what's going on? <laughs> Who is this heretic? Uh, and I'm speculating a little bit, by the way, but uh, the reality is I just wonder whether Satan's paranoia is now a desire for revenge. Because you think this guy puffed up on pride, mighty in power, a great angel, and who, by what force is he undone? A poor, powerless, unseen, unknown, poverty-stricken Hebrew woman, right? Very young, and she was at the center. That's the one to whom Gabriel went. And he used all the powers of the world, Herod and, the, and, and all the power structures to try and stop it. And he was beaten. God's promise came true. And I think that explains the bewildering array of forces that undermine what God has called beautiful and what God has called good. Uh, and I am very blessed that I have had a good mother. And I tell you, there's nothing that I can affirm more uh, than this in light of not just what the Scripture says, but also my own experience. Um, okay, how shall I spend my last 10 minutes? I'm going to spend my last 10 minutes by talking about in my book, I've written a book, I'm not marketing it really, but it is here, but I just want to say that in the book there's a section on gender, male and female, and in each one I talk about what is a man, what is a woman, and then I say here's a, a key verse for men and here's a key verse for women. Uh, and the key verse for men is just something that's addressed directly to young men, and the key verse for women I chose uh, is from um, Peter's letter, uh, and it's, it's one that I chose because it, it says that uh, it describes what it is about women that is in God's sight very precious. And I thought, well, that demands our attention. Uh, and it's this verse, it says, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair or the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And I think it would be foolish to disregard God's idea of beauty. Uh, it would be foolish to, foolish to disregard such an affirmation as this. And let me spend the time just explaining two words that are in this verse, which are at the heart of what God calls beautiful and at the heart of what God calls eternally beautiful. Uh, and it is the word, it's translated in the translation I read, gentle. I think a much better word, a richer word is meek. Uh, and the other word is very often translated quiet and I think that makes some women a little concerned. Uh, does that mean I should uh, shut up or talk softly or... No, it's a virtue, it's not some forced thing. Uh, and the actual Greek word is peaceable, and it's translated elsewhere in the New Testament as peaceable, and that's the meaning if you look it up in the concordance, peaceable. So it's a meek and a peaceable spirit, uh, which I think is a little better than quiet. Quiet might be an old way of saying that. Um, now, you say, okay, well, what are these two things? You know, meekness, um, if it's anything at all, it's a preparedness to relinquish control. Um, that's a challenging thing to say. You know, the word meek, it comes from, um, it comes from the practice of meeking a horse. And what happens when a horse is meek, or in modern terms we might say broken in, but what happens is that that horse changes, and the horse changes in a very significant way. It actually, uh, it moves away from its wild and its self-willed state, 
to become committed to the strength and the equipping and the help and the service of a person. Isn't that interesting? As when horses, horses are beautiful animals, and when they're doing that, it's like that's what they were made for. Um, and that was called meeking a horse way back when, and that's where the word comes from. Um, and Jesus said that He was meek and lowly in heart. That's the only time that Jesus ever describes His own in, inner character in the Bible. He says, I am meek and lowly in heart. And you think, well, what, what made Jesus meek? Well, you think of Him in Gethsemane. He says, look, this is what I want, but ultimately not my will but yours be done. That's what He says to the Father. Um, you know, you think of Mary as well when the angel visits her, and she says, look, it's almost like she's saying, I don't get it, but, you know, let it be unto me as you say. Let's go, let's, let's go with this. This is God's plan. I'm letting go. I'm, I'm letting God take control. And that's a very hard word in this sense, because the New Testament speaks to women in particular about meekness, especially in marriage. Uh, men are called to the sacrificial love of Christ, Ephesians, like that's the emphasis, and women are called to the meekness of Christ. Um, so it turns out that marriage is very difficult uh, on both sides, but very, very sanctifying because it makes us like Christ. And here's the thing, just as men shy away from true responsibility, and that's why young men struggle with idleness and time-wasting, I think Young, I think women struggle, they shy away from meekness, sometimes for good reasons, uh, but ultimately because I think there is a desire for control. And you say, why? Well, reason number one, risk, right? That's the big one, risk. It's risky. And I want to say that every act of meekness, and we're all called to meekness, by the way, there's the ultimate meekness toward God, and that's absolute. But then there's other categories of meekness in the Christian life, other categories of submission, to use the alternate word. And um, wives to husbands is one. There are six or seven different categories. They're not absolute. Uh, there's lines, there's limits, right? Uh, but we're all called to this. And I want to say that every act of meekness, even towards the state, submission to the government sometimes, and we don't like that either. But every time we do something like that, it is an act of faith because God is in control on our behalf when we are not in control, okay? And we can trust God when we do this. The second reason is oppression. So they say, well, um, you're telling me that I should be subjugated. And I want to make this point, no, not at all, because this virtue cannot be coerced. It can't be. You can't, you can't make someone meek uh, unless you abuse them. The person themselves has to be meek, as in it has to be something that arises from within them. It's a virtue from their character, their heart. Um, and so I would say this, if anybody is coercing it from you by force or manipulation, avoid that person, because that is not right. But if this is something which you which you bring to a relationship by voluntary choice and as a virtue that arises within you, that's a different story. That's a different thing. Um, and I would say that no meekness is ever absolute. Um, when someone tells you to sin, you don't sin, for example, uh, except your meekness to God. Reason number three that this is hard is anxiety. Uh, anxiety can become a controlling impulse. Everything needs to be just so. You know, there must be designs in my head and we must achieve them, we must get there. Uh, and there's sort of a, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a complexity there. I just want to say this, anxiety needs to be dealt with. Maybe it needs some medical dealings, but also spiritual dealings. Jesus said, and this is really tough, do not be anxious. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> and doubtless it's complicated, but it is a part of our sanctification for anxiety and worry about tomorrow to 
be removed, be leaving our life because it is He who has tomorrow. And that's my ultimate faith. It's in His control, not mine. Um, now, the last reason is, uh, well, you just don't want to. Uh, and this is a thing I said for young men, there's a, they just don't want to take responsibility. Something holds them back. Uh, and I think for young women, there's just a need to assert and control. Uh, and as idleness afflicts young men, control afflicts young women. Just want to manipulate. Uh, and you know, men will manipulate through cruelty and force and brutishness and emotional withdrawal. Women are more subjective in their tactics. Uh, they manipulate circumstances, they sow seeds of suggestion. Their minds are kind of storyboarding, running ahead all the time, uh, working out what people are thinking, how they're feeling, preempting the next move, maybe even sort of co opting a few girlfriends into the picture to sort of drop a seed, to make a suggestion, uh, to get ideas and prompts sort of coming from multiple angles. That's the realm, yeah, I'm onto you. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> it's, the, it's the realm of the subjective and the interpersonal, right? And I want to just say this. And this is hard, but that's an abuse of feminine giftings. It is. I mean, you have those giftings, but it's meant to be godly help, not what I call femcraft. Uh, <laughs> I'm not scarred, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> and all of this reminds us of a very tough call to meekness. But you know what? No virtue is easy, and nothing that Christ was in holiness is easy, but it is, this verse does not tell us that it's hard, it tells us that it's beautiful. It tells us that it's eternally valuable and held as worthy by God. And you say, well, what does it mean to be quiet? Uh, well, it means peaceable. And see how I've just described somebody who is at peace, who is calm, who is not controlling, who is not troubling, who is actually there as a source of, well, a life-giving source, a strength-giving source, something that is a presence that makes peace, uh, and a presence that makes a, a peaceful home, if that's the sphere that God has given you, um, peaceable and meek. And it's beautiful. And let me say a, a word, I'm about to get like roped off the stage probably, um, but I am nearly, I'm really nearly done. Uh, just on the beauty thing, it talks about this contest between external beauty and internal beauty, and that is a real contest which the Bible speaks about often, and there's a warning here, which is that, you know, external beauty, if you've got it, great. Uh, God made us all, and you think of someone like Esther, her, in, her external beauty was key to God being able to use her in His plan there is a good that that can be directed towards, but I'll tell you this, it is very often the case that external beauty is not matched with internal character of the same caliber. Uh, and the reason is that uh, if a woman in particular has external beauty, then the world will give her everything. Uh, she has an incredible influence and power over people and all the rest of it that others don't have. And the problem when the world is giving you everything is that you get deceived into thinking that you really do have everything. And that was the sin of the church at Laodicea, where he said, you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I lack nothing. You're deceived, you, you've got a lot. You're materially prosperous and all the rest of it. And you know what? It's deceived you because you don't even realize that you are poor and blind and pitiable and naked. Therefore, repent. And so there's a warning here, which is that external beauty is not wrong at all, I'm not saying that, but be warned, match it with an internal character so that God can use what He's given you as a gift for His purposes. And finally, and genuinely finally, uh, you know, a lot of the things I have said, you can see obviously, and this is the context of Genesis 2, how the ultimate place where these things seem to come together is in marriage. And I always get asked the question, well, what about single people? Um, and I think I'm in a good position to answer this. Uh, and the answer, they say, well, what can I do as, say, a single woman? And the answer is anything. Uh, 
you know, if it's in God's will and, and it's wise and all the rest of it, these words are not ceilings, they're flaws, they're foundations, okay? Now, I wouldn't advise someone, to, a woman to be an MMA fighter, okay? There are some things that you're going to go, that's really at odds with developing femininity, I think. Uh, I do believe that the pastoral call, that spiritual responsibility is something God has given to men. Um, but, you know, other than that, I, I couldn't say, absolutely, here's a word from God, don't do this. Um, but I want to make this point. When people are exceptions, and I said this at the start, it can mean that they are available to do something unique and different. I will say exceptional, but I don't mean necessarily high and lofty, I just mean unique and different and particular in God's kingdom and for God's work and God's will. Uh, Jesus said, there are some made eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. And the Apostle Paul puts his hand up and says, well, that'd be me. Uh, and that does happen. And whatever, it might be, and even if you're in that position by your own stupidity, uh, never forget that God can restore the years that the locust has eaten, to use the, the prophet's words. Never forget that God can supply all your need according to His riches in Christ Jesus. He can bring something great out of something dark. Never forget that. That's God's redemptive power. Um, but I would say this, we must never completely neglect our femininity or our masculinity. These are foundations. And even if we are not in a marriage context, there are ways in which those innate qualities that God has put within us can bless the world in which we live. I'll tell you straight away, there is a whole world of children out there right now, and they need people in their life who love them, who look out for them, who understand them. Don't neglect them. And there is a feminine calling that makes you very good at that. Don't forget it. Don't forget the rendering of strength and aid and support. And so when God made male and female, He called us to be something, and I think it's time we recovered that truth and built in ourselves the kind of virtue that makes us what we were created to be. And it is the loss of this truth, I think, decades ago, or the undermining of it for decades, which has ultimately led to our present gender crisis. This has been brewing for a long time. And so may God help us to be a great witness and a great light to a very lost and a very confused world. Thank you.